the Ideators Funding Landscape Session and um, we are so thankful to have, re returning back to the stage, Eric Dobson of Angel Capital Group. Come on out, mate. And his face lost all expression. Said if you're gonna play the game, boy, you gotta learn to play it right. You got to know when this is what I do for a living. <laughs> okay. Anyway, hi, I'm Eric Dobson. I'm the CEO of Angel Capital Group. We're a multi-city, fully syndicated angel group. We're in about 10 cities right now. We'll be in about 20 by the end of the year. So early stage funding is something I know and know well. So that's sort of my, my preamble, and I'll tell you more about me in just a second. But a couple things. One, um, I'm going to, if you, if you want to reach me afterwards for copies of the slides or something, info at angelcapitalgr.com. If you want to say nice things while I'm talking on Twitter, you're welcome to do so. That's Angel Capital GR is our Twitter handle, and our website is theangelcapitalgroup.com. So check us out. If you want to be an angel, come talk to me. Or if you want money for a startup, come talk to me. Anyway, so here I am. We'll, we'll jump right into this. How did I get here? I actually started out my professional career as a fuzzy-haired scientist. I was working for the government, and I, out of frustration one day, I started a company having no clue what that really meant <laughs> or how to get there. And so I ended up founding three companies. Uh, some very, had assisted in six more, had some tremendous success, had some tremendous failure. Uh, and I've now led investments in, actually it's 25 companies in the last uh, three years. So I've put in my Malcolm Gladwell's you know, 10,000 hours at this point. So I, this is a market I know well. And you know, it's, it's difficult for people, a lot of people to get into this market simply because of the challenges, and we'll talk about that for a second. So first things first, why is this so important? Why does early stage capital matter? It's not just about funding companies. Ultimately, it's about creating jobs. This is a Bureau of Labor uh, graph data, basically, that says all net job creation since 1980 is in startup companies, okay? Big companies move jobs around, small companies create jobs. Okay, so that's why this is important. So let's talk about a little bit of a history lesson. The Great Depression was caused not in small part by fraudulent private equity. Okay, people were literally standing on street corners selling stock in companies that had no business plans, no value whatsoever. And the SEC was formed in the crash, and they never forgot that, unfortunately. They've sort of held it against private equity all along. Um, so first thing the SEC did was outlaw private equity investing. So what we see is a dismal economic condition from 1929 to 1933. As you'd expect, there's no money for startups. There's no startups, there's no jobs, no job creation. Okay, so what comes out of that is the wealthy people go back to Congress and they say, we have to have a way to invest in startup companies. Okay, so they, they create what's called the Reg D exemption. The Reg D exemption said that accredited investors could invest in private equity stocks. And in 1933, they set the rules there and it was a person making $200,000 by themselves or filing jointly 300,000 and, and or a million in net worth. Now in 1933, that was fabulous wealth. But those didn't change until 2008. So we minted angel investors for 70 years. Suddenly in 2008, we hit the, we go through the tech bubble, we hit the, the housing bubble crash, and suddenly Congress steps in, or SEC steps in, and takes out the primary residence of the investor. So suddenly, just because you had a nice house, you were an angel investor, you know, coming in the 1990s and the, and the early 2000s. Not so much anymore. So here we go again. We take out 50% of the angels in the market in 2008. Guess what? We go back to dismal job creation. Okay, so 2010 comes along. <laughs> Congress says that's not what we meant to do. And they, pr they pr basically compelled the SEC to create what was called the Jobs Act. Uh, they enacted the Jobs Act, which compelled the SEC to allow several lifting of several long-standing prohibitions for private equity, one of which was called general solicitation. I'll come back to that. Um, so 2014, the SEC's rules were released, and in 14, crowdfunding was born, effectively. Now, there are two forms, oh, actually, let me step back. Why do people do this, okay? Why do people want to invest in private equity? Well, it's very simple. One, they want to invest in their communities. They want to create jobs, protect their way of life, stop brain drain, give their children you know, opportunities to, to, to remain in our communities. So that's one. People work where they want to live now. 
the internet's been a great equalizer. So now we can work, we can literally choose where we want to live and then, then find a place to work or bring our work with us. So capturing innovation in your backyard has never been easier. It, you know, forming a company has never been cheaper or easier in the history of man. Uh, so what we're seeing is a tremendous move towards, you know, we're finding now true innovation coming out of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, Portsmouth, Ohio, Morgantown, Virginia. This is where we're finding innovation now. We're seeing a big, big uh, movement of innovation and people out of the traditional angel centers, the, the investments, the venture centers like uh, San Francisco, New York, uh, out into the, what we call the heartland. Okay, it's the best performing asset class. Nobody knows this. The angel industry in 2010, at the height of the recession, was still getting 27% annualized returns. That was two and a half times the S&P in 2010. Okay, the S&P 500. So that's a huge deal. It's fun. We all want to be part of that next big thing, okay? This is like hanging out with Steve Jobs and Waz in the garage and writing that first check, and we all want to think we can do that, okay? So why don't we do it? Well, it's very simple. It's extremely risky stuff. Five in 10 of these things are gonna fail. And unless you've got that kind of tolerance for risk, it's hard to wait through the five failures to get to the five successes. So people are, are intimidated by it, to be quite blunt. The also th thing you'll see is it's hard to get into the market. How do I, there's no E-Trade for private equity, okay? There's no, there's no one site you go to to sign up and say, I wanna be an angel investor, okay? So public and private markets fundamentally act differently. Okay, so it's, again, very difficult, different players. We're finally getting some, since the Crowdfunding Act and, and the whole uh, Jobs Act in 2014, we're starting to see platforms like AngelList come up and they, they will become the E-Trades of private equity, there's no question. But every angel I know of has at least one horror story. They have at least one that was an unmitigated disaster, it was a train wreck in, the, in, in motion, they couldn't stop it and, they, and they're just hor you know, horrified by it. So. One of the other problems you see is, aside from you know, this, this liquidity issue is part of that. You can't sell private equity stock. There's no market for it. So you wait till the, the company is acquired or, or it reaches IPO before you get your money back. So these things take five to seven years after you make an investment to harvest that. So you know, the five that make it pay for the five you lost plus many times over, but it's a long haul. Okay. So let's talk about who are the players. Uh, venture capital invests about 25 billion a year in about three to 4,000 companies. Last year was high, it was about 50 billion. Uh, angels themselves invest about 25 billion, same as venture. Uh, that could be, those are actually, the numbers are incredibly hard to quantify because not everybody reports the way they do with venture capital. So that may be as high as 60 billion. But we invest in about 60 to 70,000 companies a year. Okay, so you can see we're, we're creating a lot of companies but what I, if, you, if you do that math, is a 95% down selection between the companies that we invest in and those that get venture capital. So we, it really is about trying to pick the, the, the top one, two, three, four, five percent of companies that really have the ability to make it. So we'll talk more about that. Super angels, sometimes we get individuals that are wealthy enough that they act like venture capitalists, and that's, you'll see that in the market. Accelerators, that's where most startups go now. They go to an accelerator, to learn how to be a, an entrepreneur or to find access to capital or mentors, anything that they need. And of course, the crowd. I mentioned the crowd earlier, and there are two types of crowdfunding. One is Indiegogo, Kickstarter stuff, and that's great. We don't, we love Indiegogo and Kickstarter. It's a great way for a company to get non-diluted capital and to prove they have a market and to test their pricing strategies. It's, it, we, we think it's brilliant. Now, the other side is the equity. That's what came about in 2014, and with the big changes that are all coming on the equity side. And there are some things you need to know about crowdfunding from an equity standpoint. Okay, so let's talk about, the way it was always done was called quiet, now called quiet solicitation. Since 1933, I could meet you at a, at a coffee shop and say, I'm trying to raise capital for my company, can I talk to you or whatever, or go to a pitch day, whatever that was. And we could have a private conversation about the fact I want to sell, you know, a mil you know, 33% of my company for a million bucks. You couldn't do that in any public way. You couldn't get up on stage and say that. You couldn't put that in the newspaper. That was always the joke. You couldn't put that on the internet. If you did, you're automatically a public company, no questions asked, with all the trappings of being a public company. It was a challenge for people in the internet age, and they really wanted the ability to do this, so Congress enacted uh, these changes. 
this section of funding has been untouched. The, the SEC was told, please, God, don't touch what's already working. Leave that alone. Focus on the other stuff. And, they, and, and shockingly, they listened. Okay, but we do expect some changes in the future, probably an increase in, the, in the, some of the limits I mentioned earlier. Now then, we'll do 506C. This is what's called general solicitation. Jobs Act enabled this. So now, you can go on the internet and say you want to raise capital and give, and give away equity for it. Now, the challenge here is that we used to self-certify. So you came to me and you said, I swear I'm an angel, and I'm a, I'm a qualified angel investor. I could say I have a reasonable expectation that you are an honest person, that you've provided me enough experience, you know, person-to-person -person experience that I can trust you, therefore you are accredited. Not so much anymore. With crowdfunding, every individual investor must explicitly validate their own wealth. Okay. That's not in itself a bad thing, but no investor wants to give their tax returns to an early stage company to prove that they're accredited. You just don't want to do it. So there's some other options. The problem with the crowdfunding legislation, and this is the reason that the professional investors in our marketplace are still standing off a little bit, is the investor can be penalized, can be sanctioned for the first time in history for a company they invest in making a mistake, even without their approval. Okay? That's dangerous for the strictest interpretation of those rules say that an investor can be punished now. So here's the challenge. We want more and more and more precedents set by the SEC, more no action letters, and they're coming out before I think you're going to see a big push from the professionals, the angel groups, the venture capital folks, because every single one of, every single investor on your cap table is viewed as an individual liability by later funding it, you know, companies. Forbes predicted 5 to 50 billion in crowdfunding in 14 it was uh, equity it was about 1.5. That's how far short it fell because of these issues. So one of the challenges we're looking at is whether or not a company that goes crowdfunding early, whether or not they can go back to traditional angel and venture capital. And, and right now we don't know. Uh, long run, I'm very bullish on it. I think it's going to be a huge boon to the industry. It'll be another you know, avenue for startups to get you know, much needed capital. So I think that's great, but there's still some challenges. Okay, this is what's coming up in May. Now we can invest, non-accredited investors can start investing in May as a percentage of your annual income. Um, so, but the problem is no company wants to have a thousand shareholders when you're a young company. Every one of those shareholders takes some amount of time to, to manage. And so that, that's the challenge. So yet to be seen what's going to happen here. It could, be, it, it could be very interesting. It will be interesting. But we don't know if it's going to truly have the impact the SEC is, is hoping. The other one I'll talk about is Reg A+. Not many people know this. Along with the Jobs Act, they created this. Sarbanes-Oxley, after the Enron scandal, more or less neutered the whole IPO market. In fact, we see companies going private. Not only are the best and brightest not going public, but we're seeing public companies go private now for the first time you know, in, in, in mass uh, over the last several years. So used to, you could go public at 10 million revenue. Sarbanes-Oxley made that, those economics change. You can't until you at least 100 million in, a, in annual revenue. <clears throat> just, to, just, just to even bother with it, okay? So we see companies like Microsoft making 99% of their value in the public markets and Facebook making 50 because they wait longer and longer and longer to go public. So we're waiting, and this is, this is going to be the key, the private equity exchanges to mimic the public markets. That's going to be a big, big, big thing to this industry because it's going to essentially restore the small cap IPO, give uh, angel and, and venture folks earlier liquidity, uh, and, and th that, that will change the industry fundamentally. We're probably a couple years out from that right now. Okay, current market trends. Every industry that's gone to the internet has found the same thing. Just because you can reach more people doesn't mean the business rules have changed. Okay, same with crowdfunding, same with this whole thing. We see companies going to, you know, to AngelList, for instance, and they'll, they'll do the, the, the pitch, either whether or not they do it as a 506B or C deal, it doesn't matter. Until they find a lead investor, a named lead investor, they tend to languish on these platforms. As soon as they find a lead investor, everybody dogpiles. They always say everybody wants to be the first in line to write the second check. Okay, so you still have to find that lead investor. That rule hasn't changed. All the venture capital firms have moved upstream. They don't do early stage stuff anymore. The economics just don't work for them. 
So the angels have, we call it the professionalization of the angel market. We've had to become the professionals at this. We now have to do all the diligence they used to do, all the hard work. We are definitely seeing a bubble in the valley. Some of the unicorn valuations, the wheels are already coming off uh, on, on the valley, and that's going to be a tumble. I don't think it's going to affect the rest of the country because we're not seeing that kind of a bubble. We're still seeing great valuations. There's always an East Coast versus West Coast money thing. The East Coast is sort of governed by the banking culture, so it's, risk, it's more risk averse. West Coast is governed by the gold miner culture. It's much more risk tolerant. So what we're seeing if essentially, and I'll say this probably again later if I do, pardon me, West Coast is much more aggressive on the crowdfunding. East Coast is not uh, at this point in time. I, I did want to mention that one of the things I forgot in here, IP still commands a uh, premium outside of some of the, like, like Silicon Valley. Um, so don't forget that. There's still great value in intellectual property. Um, I will say, to, I was talking to one of the uh, earlier presenters on, at lunch, and don't ask a professional investor for an NDA. <laughs> they won't sign it. We can't create liabilities for ourselves simply by going out and doing our job and doing diligence on your company. So learn to talk about the value of your intellectual property and not the secret sauce. Tell me why this creates, why it has value, why it creates a competitive advantage. And if we have to know more, we'll ask more, and then we can talk about NDAs. But if you ask a professional investor for an NDA up front, you're already halfway to the circular file. Okay. Just want to make sure I understand that. And entrepreneurs, your lawyers may tell you differently, and I'm not trying to beat up on lawyers, but make sure you understand what that means when you ask somebody for an NDA. Okay, competition is global, and that's not going to change, okay? You're not competing with just the company next door or down the street or even, you know, even New York. You're competing with, with companies in China now. So you've got to learn to stand out. The other thing we're talking about is the Series A crunch, and this is a really a big challenge. The venture capitalists continue to move upstream, and so there's a big gap between where the angels fund and where the venture capitalists fund, and we think that's going to expand this year. Okay. This is a very, very, very ugly graph, and I was hoping I would have a, uh, a, a laser to, to talk about this, but we used to talk about the chasm of death here. Companies essentially get overvalued early, then the reality sets in. That's usually where angels get involved. Okay, we get involved, and, and we basically drop kick companies over what we used to call the chasm of death. Okay, that's moving from your early adopters to your early majority adopters. Now, the VCs used to be there to catch them. Boom. You know, that was, that was a great relationship. The venture capitalists continue moving that way. So unfortunately, we, we, this, the chasm has now become what we call the Series A crunch. And that's, that may expand this year. There's a lot, of real, a lot of thought that that will expand. So let's boil this all down. I live in a world where we take a big cloud of data and we boil it down to getting consensus of a large group of people to invest or not. So it, let's, let's talk about what it means. Many crowdfunding paths are out there, many funding paths are out there. They don't necessarily inter inter intertwine. So understand which one you're doing uh, before you start. We had a company recently that came to us with a 506C deal, and we didn't realize it until the last minute, and we weren't, we're just not doing 506C deals yet. And so it was, a, it was a big breaking point, and they had found that all over the southeast, that they were having huge problems. They'd gone through a tech startup accelerator in Denver, and they had Den the Denver folks had said, oh, you've got to do crowdfunding. Well, that's because they're, they're closer to the West Coast. So understand where you are and what that means in the long term. The wrong capital can be your undoing. If you take money from the wrong investor, it can absolutely, it's, it's worse than no money. So understand this landscape really, really well before you start trying to raise money. And I know it's not, e and I, I know it's, I make that sound easy. It's not as easy as it sounds. Um, I talked about East and West Coast. The, the professionals are not embracing crowdfunding yet. It will happen. It will be a fantastic addition to the market, but we're still a couple years away from that. Reg A has huge potential. I mean, this, this could be a big, big, big change in our industry, but the exchanges don't exist yet, so we don't know where that's going yet. Okay. There will always be money for great deals, period. That's never going to stop. The challenge is, if you have a, you know, it, and I'm, entrepreneurs are going to hate me for saying this, but if you're not getting funding, it's your fault, okay? It means there's something wrong with your deal or something wrong with your presentation, and you need to work on that. And there are, there are some scholarly works on this, but ultimately it's just talking to investors and getting their feedback, but asking for honest feedback. And that's tough for us to give sometimes because people get defensive. 
You don't like my baby. I'm trying to tell you why your baby needs braces, okay? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay. So investors, there's still, we're seeing studies now coming out saying that venture capitalists, as we see them continuing to move up, will only invest in deals that have been formally invested in by angel, organized angel groups. Okay, so the angel group is becoming more valuable as a centralizing investment force in the early markets. And so I, I would say to you, anyone that wants to be an angel, join an angel group. There's a bunch of them in the state, join one. Uh, both sides, entrepreneurs, we, we can make you better by, by helping you craft your pitch, and most importantly, we can get your funding if you do it right. Uh, let's see, who else should you talk to? I'm not gonna read these, but Angel Capital Association, Angel Resource Institute, Kauffman Foundation, lots of information for entrepreneurs and for angels. Uh, great groups in, in you know, Angel List, I mentioned earlier, that will be the E-Trade of private equity. Lots and lots and lots of angel funds here. Um, you've got a, a whole bunch of angel funds. You've got a bunch of you know, early stage VCs. We're one of the few states that still has early stage VCs because of the Tenant Invesco program from 2010. That's been a, a big, big, big. It's Tennessee stands out, ironically, stands out really strongly because we still have early stage VCs. Okay, so I'm getting very, very close to my time here. So let's, let's, let's talk about my call to action. If I have to describe the angel market uh, in one word, it's noisy, okay? There's an awful lot of information, companies, big, you know, ch big sweeping changes in regulations here, and there's a tremendous amount of noise. So if you really want to pop up and get funding in today's marketplace, and we fund 10 to 15 companies a year, eight to 12 right now, it'll probably be 15 by the end of the year, and that's out of about 1,000 applications per year. Okay, that's, that's what it takes to, to, so you've got to stand out. If you don't have a marketing guru on your startup team, start over. Nowadays, you have to have the marketing and sales people, the plan up front. You heard, you heard Kevin say it too. Marketing, sales, and I would add exiting. Show me how you're going to be acquired so that I get my money back or people behind me do. Because essentially, I meant to say this earlier, the sharks make this whole thing look so easy. I mean, they do. They, they show up, companies walk in, they, they do a little talk, and they say, I'll give you money, and they make a deal. The reality is actually much, much, much more complex. We're the people that sort of sit behind the scenes, essentially, at Shark Tank. We find the companies. We get them ready. We make sure they're, you know, they go do the pitch. After the pitch, we make sure they've got all the deal documents, and on, and on, and on, and on, and on. There's a, there's a, there's a mile between those two endpoints that they make look so easy. Uh, but essentially, marketing, sales, and exiting. Once, once we love your product and we love you, it's all about sales, marketing, and exit. So learn how to talk to people like me, okay? I'm interested in knowing if you're gonna sell, market sell and return capital. Get engaged, okay? It's never been cheaper, easier to start a company in the history of man. Uh, in, there's intellectual property all over the place that we're seeing that's underutilized. Great opportunities, okay, for angels. It's a great time to be an angel. Look at all the stuff that's going on. We've got this small cap market thing coming back in the next couple years. I mean, it's really an exciting time to be in private equity. Um, so join an angel group, okay? Go to the Angel Capital Association and be a member there. But the biggest thing I wanna make sure everybody understands is we do need to fix some things about the crowdfunding rules. And part of that is forcing them to clarify <laughs> some of these more draconian penalties for investors and get that, get, get, stay on your reps and st to stay on the SEC to get that stuff fixed so we can all put more money into more companies, create more jobs, basically create the kind of communities we all want to live in. So that's my pitch. I think I'm 26 uh, seconds uh, early, so if there's one or two questions, I wouldn't mind taking a question. Do I have one? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's the name of my game, yes. You may not want an exit strategy because by the time you're ready to exit, you might be giving up your company for one year's revenue. I, I won't argue with the point, but I will say this. For so many uh, people, if you don't know where you're going, it's hard to get there. I mean, if you don't at least have a general class of how I want to be acquired, it's hard to create the kind of acquirer value. In other words, if I know I want to be acquired by 3Com, I'm going to go file patents that fill holes in 3Com's you know, program or something, I'm, I'm gonna go and create, I'm gonna make myself so 
enticing the three com, they can't they can't help but buy me. So I, my my issue is is not necessarily um, when to exit as much as have a plan. Tell me who are your top three acquirers most likely, how you're going to create value for them because I want to know you can do that. Does that make sense? Okay. So yes, one more. Right that, that sounds so much like flipping, right? Let me buy a house, fix it up, and flip it. Whatever happened to the old growing the business thing? And is there any place for angels in, in growing businesses for the longer term? Yes and no. It depends on, I mean, if, if we see a company that's literally, and we do, we invested one recently that we think is going to be a billion dollar company, and we're prepared to ride that as long as it takes to get there. But the vast majority of acquisitions in today's market are between 20 and 50 million. Okay? That's why the VCs are having to move further and further upstream to get larger and larger deals. So for us, the most likely event is that a company is going to exit for 20 to 50 million, and we want you to be prepared to, to justify that kind of valuation and right, acquisition. I'll sell 20 million today. today, exactly. Right. Deal. I got my checkbook. So, anyway. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for your time today. I really enjoyed it. I'll be around, so let me know if you need anything. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Dobson, once again, thanks so much, man.